Hello, I'm Eric Snodgrass, and thank you for watching today's long-range forecast video brought to you by Nutrient Ag Solutions. This analysis is being provided for perspective only, and any decision made based upon this presentation is the sole responsibility of the person making the decision. Finally, please remember that all long-range weather forecasting is speculative by nature. Now, in tomorrow's update, we're going to discuss the latest numbers we've seen out of the severe weather that came here in, in around parts of Nashville and rest of the Mid-South here. Now, some of that severe weather did make its way all the way to the Mid-Atlantic, but the focus here on this video right now is going to be the severe weather we're anticipating down here uh, from eastern Texas all the way over to southern Georgia where we do have uh, severe thunderstorm watches out. We also have um, a tornado watch down here in parts of southern Alabama and Georgia and then the whole region is under a flood watch with already many places reporting flood warnings. We're going to come back to that in a second. Meanwhile on the high plains uh, you know getting into parts of eastern Colorado here in a lot of, of, of Nebraska and northern Kansas we are have a we have a flag a red flag warning out for this time which is an increased fire threat and also very strong winds moving through parts of Montana. You can see them over there in the animation on the right showing that downslope flow which is often uh, adiabatically compressed which basically means it's 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 uh, downslope motion, very dry air that's blowing across here with some stronger winds. So the storm prediction centers identified three different areas with at least elevated risk of fires today. But if we come back to thinking about the problems we're having down south, remember we were watching one system, the lead wave, create a low pressure system that is now sitting here uh, off of the northeast part of the United States. The main frontal boundary out of that is stretched into this area. We knew that it was going to be along that frontal boundary that our next cutoff low was going to move. So we're feeding this with a lot of moisture out of the Gulf of Mexico. It's hitting that boundary running over the top of it and that's why you can see widespread rain from Texas all the way here uh, to South Carolina in the day today. This is just a snapshot of the radar uh, valid just before the noon hour here in, in, in Central Time Zone. So this is uh, going to be continue to be a very, very wet and soggy and stormy day across that region that I just circled there. Storm Prediction Center, just to kind of give you the broader stroke area here of where we have the highest risk for severe weather today, it's going to stretch from eastern Texas clear over to southern Georgia and northern Florida. So watch right there along the Gulf Coast for the greatest risk of severe weather. And then tomorrow it really stays isolated here in southern Georgia and northern Florida. The wave that was creating this problem is slowly getting pulled back into the main flow. So the main flow right now is kind of split into two branches and you can see the northern branch there, the southern branch is down here, and uh, the open wave that we saw yesterday is finally getting pulled into this flow which is going to take it across the United States and hopefully get it out of here in the next couple of days. But on its way out it will be producing quite a bit of heavy rainfall. So this is just a, an, an outlook here through Sunday evening as to how much rain we are anticipating. And uh, with the action, the moisture being transported into that boundary that you just saw me draw, the heaviest rainfall is in this corridor from parts of central and eastern Texas all the way over to southern uh, parts of North Carolina and then most of South Carolina. So we're going to be able to pick up here anywhere between an inch and a half and in some locations almost four inches of rainfall, while much of the rest of the country north of there is going to experience relatively drier conditions. We are on the lookout in the near term for a, a couple of systems to sneak right through here and there will be cold enough air on this uh, on these two systems to come through and bring in some snow to parts of the Canadian prairies, sneaking into northern Minnesota, Wisconsin, the UP of Michigan. But overall, we're seeing warmth in this area, much above average temperatures, keeping things away from snow and also quite dry at this time. So let's get into this longer term discussion because that's what these videos are, are all about. We've been discussing that the number one feature to be watching is the position of that ridge. We've watched it retreat away from the west coast of the United States and pull back back here toward the Aleutian Islands. And what that's allowed to happen is the coldest anchors, which are in the northern hemisphere here, tucked away north of Alaska and in and around Greenland, North Atlantic, well, we're finally being able to drop a trough into this area. And that trough is going to be such that we return moisture to California, but pieces of this will continue to break off and run across the United States. Now what that means is that sets us up with a relatively active weather pattern for much of the United States, but because we are not getting rid of the pattern that's got us into a milder or moderate temperature pattern by keeping the cold air way far up north, each one of these systems that comes through brings in the rainfall. 
but what it doesn't do is it bring in lasting colder weather. So let's talk about that rainfall. Now I've already showed you the heavy rain we're expecting through the next few days here. So I'm taking that off the page and only looking at days 5 through 15 in the forecast. So this gets you all the way out uh, to the 18th. So this is the 10 day period leading up to uh, the 18th, all right? And we see the effects of that ridge sliding back in this direction and the development of that trough. We keep the whole of this region very active with weather systems that are coming through. So again, the trajectory is something like this. And with wide open Gulf of Mexico moisture support, it's going to remain on the wetter side of things. So as we think longer term about this pattern, what does it mean as we progress into and through the month of March and get ourselves into spring? we got to answer those questions in this video. Because we know getting up to this point, so far year to date, we have a pretty sizable part of that region I just circled for you there that's seen anywhere between 150 and some locations well over 2 to 300 percent of normal precipitation, specifically right in through this corridor here, extremely wet conditions. Where we've had the void has been over California, and we're about to close that up with this trough dipping down off of the western part of the United States. So I mentioned earlier this week I was doing some research on snowpack, so let's talk about that first. What you're looking at is a snapshot just a few days ago, a good clear day out west to show us the extent of the snowpack. And throughout much of the Rocky Mountains, as we see right in through here, we have quite a bit of snow. When you get over into parts of the inner mountain west into the Great Basin, so I'm talking about here in parts of Nevada, for example, and into parts of Utah, northern Arizona, snowpack is a little bit less in extent. In other words, it's not getting down the slopes into the valleys. And we've been reporting on the fact that the Sierra Nevada have been sitting at 40 to 60 percent of normal. So when we look at that, just take a look at the map on the right. This is the latest basin average snow water content map. And we can see where those deficits are, are really showing up. It's primarily in this region because the flow throughout much of this year, remember, has come in like this, really pulled through the Rocky Mountains, and that's why the numbers look good in the Rockies, but poorer as you get over into this area. Now, we do know change is coming for California, change is coming for Nevada, change is coming for Oregon. But I want you to understand that my research, I read about five or six papers to try to understand what happens east of the Rocky Mountains if there's good snowpack through the month of March. And I was quite surprised to find that in each one of the papers, they suggested that using the Western United States snowpacks and snow cover as an indicator on the setup for spring weather patterns isn't a primary predictor, which means while it is very influential for the western part of the United States, east of there, it is not a good predictor on understanding what the pattern is going to be. But the only thing that it suggested is this could lead to more sensible cooling of the western United States and therefore enhance more troughing features out west, but the statistical relationship was, was not strong. So we're going to have to be careful with using this as any sort of a predictor. I just wanted to complete that kind of loophole in the research that I was explaining to you. So let's talk about snow because this is a map I tweeted out yesterday looking at the snow water equivalent right now. And if you look at where outside of the Intermountain West, outside of the Rocky Mountains, where we do have snowpack on the ground, it's really the eastern halves of North and South Dakota, cutting through almost all of Minnesota, and then really the northern two-thirds of Wisconsin and the northern two-thirds of Michigan, including the UP here. Outside of that, we are snow-free across a significant portion of the United States, which at times will have snow on the ground at this point uh, in, in March. All right. Now, I want to take those drawings off there, and I want to show you what it looked like a year ago. So this is March 4th, 2020. This is March 4th, 2019. Now, we just had a system that came through and brought this snow in, but the snowpack that you see here had been around for a long time. We had very similar snowpack in the mountains. Let me just toggle back and forth for you. This is, a, this is this year, this is a year ago. So you can see very similar snowpack in the mountains, with the exception of California, of course, but much more expansive snowpack sitting in this area. Now, why this was important? Well, on the 12th of March a year ago, deep troughs swung through here and made one of the largest low pressure systems I have ever seen that went racing through the midsection of the United States. And we're going to talk about that very soon because the flooding event that occurred on that March 12th and 13th of 2019, that set us up for disaster for the remainder of the year. Right now, though, look. We only have snow to melt in this area, and this is a very positive thing. Let's keep talking about it. 
March of 2019 looked like this in terms of statewide average temperature ranks. Throughout almost the whole of the United States, it was a near average to cooler than average month. Now with that in the back of your mind, I want to show you what the precipitation pattern in the upper level flow looked like. So look over here on the right, that is the divisional precipitation ranks. We were very wet in this corridor, dry northwest and dry in the southeast. So the atmosphere is punching moisture into this direction. Why was it doing that? It was primarily due to the placement of a large ridge sitting here. And therefore we had this high over low flow that did this. See that? Now, this March is looking much different because we don't have that feature sitting there over Alaska and northwestern parts of Canada. And instead, it looks much different from that. With that ridge pushing over here, we're developing a trough in this corridor. And what that's doing is that's allowing for much above average temperatures over the next five days here. That extends out in the day 10 through 15 uh, time period. And it also shows up in day 10, uh, excuse me, that was previously day 5 through day 10 over there on the right. And now this is day 10 through 15. So we now have a ridge here, a trough feature there, which gives us the active pattern but it's much different than it was in March of 2019. And that's the critical point that I want you to see here, all right? So we're looking at, especially in this part of the United States, a much warmer March than we saw a year ago. So let's get into the discussion about this, all right? The maps you see down here are from March 10th through April 10th. And we see with that ridge retreating, developing over the Aleutian Islands, with the trough developing here, we're expecting to bring up precipitation amounts in the west, which has been a narrative we've been carrying in our Western Regional Analysis now for about a month. And it's still allowing the subtropical branch of the jet stream, excuse me, to keep parts of the Ohio River Valley in the Northeast on the wetter side of things. I believe that we are biased too dry where the European model is showing dry. I think it's gonna be wetter than that as we progress through March. And the reason why I think the model looks the way it does, I've kind of highlighted for you up here in the upper right. So I'll get those drawings up there so you can see it. What's not changed, we still have the very strong Arctic Oscillation and the cold North Atlantic. There will not be a significant polar stratospheric vortex disruption as we finish this spring. When I say significant, something that could upset the pattern. We're watching the Aleutian Ridge and the, the trough that's coming off of California as increasing the precipitation here. We still see relatively strong and zonal subtropical jet, okay, that's what we talked about, and more ridging than not sitting over this area. The MJO is evading, avoiding the cold phases, and there is no signal coming from El, El Nino region that I can hang my hat on. I will say this, global winds are still quite strong, and that's something we're going to talk about next. But that gives us a pattern that favors a cooler bias out west with much above average temperatures. Uh, let me be careful there with the probability of seeing below normal temperatures in the eastern half of North America at being relatively low odds. Okay, so that's the way to interpret this. This is not going to be a blowtorch of a march for the eastern half of the country, all right? Now, the models are banking on persistence here. And if it stays persistent, we're going to get a spring-like frequency of low-pressure systems, which is why I think, if I get those drawings off there again for you, sorry, I think that the whole of this region has a wetter bias. If I'm wrong, I'm going to be wrong about Alaska. I'm going to be wrong about the lack of a block. If a block moves in, that will change this whole pattern, and that will be something that I will miss. Now, I don't hope I'm going to miss it at this point, but I want you to all know that that's what I'll be watching. Now, when you start to see the map over there on the right and you see the warm anomalies forecast for the eastern part of the country, I was starting to get several questions about what this upcoming March might possibly look like because some folks are starting to get concerned that it reminded them of, well, March of 2012. Now, I want to put a, a very important disclaimer on what we're about to do. What got us the March of 2012 is much different than what we've got right now. And what I mean by that is while you might think that there are similarities when looking over here at what the flow pattern of the upper atmosphere looked like throughout the month of March in 2012 with a trough in this area, a ridge sitting over here, the main differences are in the North Atlantic and with the strength of this ridge sitting over the uh, Great Lakes states. We are not seeing that this go around. It's a much different, much less amplified pattern. But what we ended up getting was, well, record warmth across a huge section of the United States. So what I want to do now is I'd like to dispel some of the myths 
that with the warm March we're currently forecasting, that it is not looking like 2012. Here's some better evidence of that. We often look at our ocean temperatures to give us some sort of correlation. Look at how cold the ocean temperatures were extending all the way out here into the Central Pacific, with warmer ocean temperatures tucked away into this area. Well, this was March 5th of 2012. This is March 2nd of 2020. We have warm ocean temperatures here, just a little bit of cool water tucked away there and cool water in through here, which basically means this is, if I kind of go back and forth here, there's some major, major differences in our ocean temperature patterns. For completeness, this was March 4th of 2019. And just thinking about the differences between last year and this year, we had much warmer conditions and almost El Nino-like behavior out of the weather due to the warmer conditions here and the westerly wind bursts that we were getting because of this. So what I'm trying to tell you is March of 2020 does not look like March of 19, nor does it look at anything like March of 12. That, is that clear? I want to make sure that that's quite clear. Here's another thing to consider. When we look back at our calculated soil moisture anomalies, some big differences between a year ago is what's going on in California and the magnitude and placement of the wetter conditions here in the midsection of the United States. Now, I've made a case that there's a lot of water here that needs to drain. But I also want to let you know that with near normal temperatures in March or even warmer than normal in March, April and May, we increase evaporation rates. And if we get increased wind speeds in here as well, we can take care of a lot of this excess moisture. And remember, right now we only have snow cover sitting here, whereas a year ago we had a whole lot more snow. So look at the differences between where the major moisture anomalies were this year compared to a year ago. It was much, much wetter in through parts of Iowa stretching into Nebraska and Kansas. Yes, the Mid-South and the Ohio Valley was just as wet but also big differences out in California too. So we need to keep an eye on this because I'm, I'm getting a bit of, I'm starting to change my mind a bit on the severity of what could be our spring flooding threat. I'm backing off a bit on what I'm wor I was originally worried about. Here's some other things that are different, and this is where we're gonna wrap this video up. You know, I often talk a lot about global winds. I want you to see something. Last March and April and May and June, our global wind anomalies were high active weather patterns. By the time we got into July, it dropped off precipitously, <laughs> and then we had the big blocking events in September that drove uh, really, really hot, dry conditions in parts of the Mid-South and Southeast. We've since built up, in general, our global angular momentum, and here's the way to think about it. When it's here above normal, which it has been from January, February, and March, okay, uh, beginning of March, excuse me, when it's been above normal like this, we tend to have lots of weather systems, more zonal flow in the jet stream, and therefore more frequent precipitation events. When it drops below that dash line, we tend to get more blocking. We need to watch carefully to see if we maintain this above normal status for a while in global winds, or does it wane or, or go back towards zero with time? Because we certainly saw that this was one of the additive, one of the, the, the constructive effects of last spring that kept things so very active for us across the Corn Belt. Keep that in mind, okay? But here's a major difference. In 2020, another global circulation pattern we watched carefully called the quasi binary Oscillation, that one right now is decreasing in strength, whereas a year ago right now it was increasing in strength. And if we were seeing an increasing in the strength of the QBO, we would expect to see the jet stream doing something like this. And that big trough right there, I'll kind of shade it in in the middle part of the United States, says active weather, cold weather, April, May, June, and things crank up. So there's a major difference this year in the quasi-biennial oscillation compared to a year ago. And that QBO was one of the things that led us to the continual forecast of wetter than average spring conditions. What I'm trying to build a case for here are differences from what we saw a year ago. I'll finish up with this. This week, I'm going to get a brand new long-range update from the European model and the seven models that go into the National Multi-Model Ensemble. What I want you to remember is this is what they were currently forecasting for April, May, and June of this year. And that is one where we were still seeing a very active but split jet stream pattern in the Pacific 
targeting like this with the strong subtropical branch coming in here, keeping this whole sector of the United States wet, whereas parts of the plains and the Canadian prairies were showing up a little bit drier than normal. I'm showing you this now because I'm, when we get the brand new updates, we need to compare this to the newest model updates for April, May, and June to see what the model trend looks like because this model was basing everything on persistence and remember, persistence is only happening until it isn't. And we're gonna watch it carefully to see if there's any sort of changes. So I want you to watch it with me. I'll give you a brand new update when that new model data comes out and we'll look at it together, all right? Have a great rest of your week. Look forward to talking again tomorrow morning. Thank you.